too much. Not to worship him. I don't expect no response from, from a teenager from a youth or young adult. I don't expect no response from that. But, but from somebody who didn't have the money to pay the light. But the lights stayed on. You didn't have money to go grocery shopping, but everybody in the household had some food. You didn't have the money to pay your rent, but you still had a roof over your head. There was a sickness in your body, the doctor didn't know what to do, but you still here. I've been through too much. Not to worship him. Yeah, yeah. And they run out of words to say, you just say hallelujah. <laughs> the Bible says that hallelujah is the highest. Praise you. You can't get no higher than hallelujah. I worship. It's for real. I, I, I love the part that says, don't, don't, don't try to figure it out. Don't try to figure out why I'm shouting. And don't try to figure out why I'm waving my hand. If, if you don't got no story, let, let me tell you mine. I'm trying to let you go. I, I'm, I'm really trying to let you go. Verses 1 and 2. All the preacher would say, if you've been in church any length of time, you've come across Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 at some point. But it was used in context or out of context. Somebody said something about it. Yeah. And I'm interested to share with you the word of God on this morning. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Trust that everyone has it. Word about God reads like this. Therefore, I urge you by the mercies of God to present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your spiritual service. Your King James lovers says, which is your reasonable service. 
this world. That's my favorite word, you know it. But be transformed. I like King James there. Be ye transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. Why? That you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Can I read that one more time? Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your spiritual or reasonable or intellectual service. Do not be conformed to this world. But if you're going to present your body as a living sacrifice to God, you have to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why is that important? So that you can prove yeah, yeah, yeah. that the will of God is good, acceptable, and pleasing. I, I, I want to preach this morning from the subject, an invitation to worship God. You may have your seat. Thank you very much, ushers. You're certainly too kind. An invitation to worship God. That's kind of an oxymoron. A person who really knows the Lord doesn't need an invitation to worship Him. <laughs> it doesn't have to be Sunday. The music don't have to be playing. Just when I think about the goodness of the Lord and, and all that he's done for me, my soul cries out. Hallelujah. An invitation to worship God. Hear me. In 1909, the founder of the Salvation Army, Reverend William Booth, was informed by his son that there was no cure, there was no recovery, there was no treatment for his eye loss. Doctors could not fix the fact that Reverend William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, had lost his eyesight. When Reverend Booth's son informed him, Daddy, the doctor just told me that there is nothing he can do to give you your eyesight back. Reverend Booth took a deep breath and said to his son, you mean to tell me that there is absolutely positively no chance of me ever seeing your face again? Answering in the affirmative, his son said, yes, Dad. That is correct. Continuing his questioning a second time, Reverend Booth asked his son, you mean to tell me that there's absolutely, positively no chance of me ever being able to see my family's faces again? With tears now welling up in his son's eyes, he answered again in the affirmative, 
Yes, Dad. That is absolutely correct. Continuing his question a third time, Reverend Booth lifted his voice and said, You mean to tell me that for the rest of my life I'm going to have to depend on somebody to take me everywhere it is I want to go? Filled with great sorrow, his son answered finally in the third, the third time, Yes! Daddy, that is absolutely correct. Taking a deep breath, almost a sigh of relief, Reverend Booth amazingly responded by saying to his son, Well, it appears that I have done all I can for God with my eyesight. Now it's time to find out what I can do for God without my eyesight. <laughs> In a real sense, ladies and gentlemen, the response of Reverend Booth to the loss of his eyesight should be the response of every baptized believer. us. He urges us 
to continuously serve God. Paul preferences his encouragement by using the result connecting word therefore. Do you see it in your Bible? Result connecting word therefore reverts us back to Romans chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11. All right, all right. Paul says, therefore, based on the argument of Romans chapters 1 through 11, where Paul essentially teaches us two things. First, Paul teaches us that it was the God of Israel who formulated a plan of salvation. Second, Paul teaches us that it was the God of Israel who executed the plan of salvation that he formulated. Paul says, based on that argument, therefore, I urge you. Hear me. If you don't understand Romans chapter 1 through 11, chapter 12 makes absolutely no sense. If you don't understand that it was God who formulated a plan of salvation and that it was God who executed his plan of salvation, then verse number 1 of chapter 12 doesn't apply to you. Paul says, I urge you, brethren, Notice who Paul is talking to. Paul is not talking to new converts. He's not talking to unsaved people. He's talking to fellow believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking to both you and I. I urge you. Word urge here in the text literally means to be invited. It means to invite someone to do something. Paul gives us an invitation to become a worshiper of God. Note that Paul does not command us to become a worshiper of God. Paul does not instruct us to become a worshiper of God. Paul urges us to become a worshiper of God. Paul invites us to become a worshiper of God. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, the difference between a command and what Paul does here in the text is that a command leaves you without options. But Paul leaves you with an option to worship God is your choice. Paul says, I urge you. I invite you to worship God. On what grounds do you urge me to worship God? Paul, Paul says, glad you asked. I urge you by the mercies of God. Paul's use of the phrase mercies of God is a reference to everything he has said in Romans chapters 1 through 11. In Romans chapters 1 through 11, Paul tells us what the mercy of God is. It was by God's mercy that he formulated a plan of salvation. It was by God's mercy that he executed his plan of salvation. Paul says, I don't have no fancy way to encourage you to come and be a worshiper of God other than the fact that he sent his son to die for your sins. And if that ain't good enough to encourage you to worship God, I don't know what is. I don't have the right song to sing. I don't have the right sermon to preach. I don't have the right outfit to wear. I don't have a whole lot of skeptics and flashy things to show you, to bring you to Christ. All I can tell you is that God sent his son to die for your sins. And if that ain't good enough to encourage you to worship God, then I am hopeless. 
Paul says, I urge you, based on what? Paul, by the mercies of God. I ain't got a whole lot of promises to give you. I don't know if God go bless you with a house, don't know. Don't know if God go bless you with a car, don't know. Don't know if you sow a seed that God's going to multiply, don't know. But what I do know is that God sent his son to die for the sins of the world. And that now we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that should be enough for a Christian to worship God. Paul says, I urge you. By the mercies of God, the mercies of God, the graceless with your presence on last week, you would have heard me preach a sermon entitled, Worshippers, or Worship the God of Israel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was in that little sermon that we raised the question, why should you be a worshiper, or why should you worship the God of Israel? If you took good notes, then you would have learned that you and I should worship the God of Israel because the God of Israel is God all by himself. But if you missed that point, then you should have learned that you should worship the God of Israel because the God of Israel is worthy of worship. And it was based on that argument that Paul eases his way into Romans chapter number 12, verse number 1, and urges us to worship the God who is worthy of worship. Paul says, I urge you by the presence of God to do what, Paul? To present your body. A living and holy sacrifice. I, Paul states, urge you to present or give your body as a living sacrifice. Not a dead sacrifice, not a half alive sacrifice, not a tired sacrifice. You know, I would worship God, but I'm just tired. I would serve God, but I had a long day. I would go to Bible study, but... Come on now. Paul says, I urge you to present your body a living sacrifice. The word living here comes from the Greek word zeo. It literally means to be active. In other words, Paul says, I urge you to present your bodies in active sacrifice. I urge you to present your bodies as an instrument that is always willing to do whatever it is that God needs you to do. The definition of living means little to nothing here as much as the grammatical features surrounding the text. Grammatical features surrounding the word living is that the word living is a particle, which means that it functions like a verb. It functions like action. But it's a particle that is used in the present tense. A particle used in the present tense shows continuous action. But Paul says, I urge you to present your bodies a living sacrifice. Paul is literally saying that I urge you to wake up every morning and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. No, no, no. no sick days, no vacation days, no extended vacations, no calling in, said I'm going to be late. Paul says, I urge you to every day present your bodies as an instrument that is willing to serve the Lord. That is, you wake up and say, Lord, what you need me to do today? 
tell nobody about themselves. You don't need me to talk about nobody. You don't need me to lie on nobody. You don't need me to despitefully use anybody. I know you don't need me for that. But what would you have me to do productive on today? Paul says, I urge you. I love the urge. It's not a command, ladies and gentlemen. I cannot make you do anything. I, I, I cannot force you to do anything, especially when it comes to serving God. Paul understands that, and thanks be to God, he has taught me that. Brother Reverend Pastor Preacher, you cannot make anybody do anything. I don't care how good of a preacher, teacher, pastor you think you are. You cannot make anybody do anything. But what you can do is what Paul does in the text. I urge you by the mercies of God to present your bodies a living sacrifice. Sacrifice here is a reference to Old Testament sacrifice. Paul is not telling you, nor is he telling I, to go strap a bomb to ourselves in the name of God. No, don't do that. But generally speaking, from a historical and a cultural context, when writers used the word sacrifice in their writing, they were not referring to an animal sacrifice as much as they were referring to a lifestyle. Paul's readers understand clearly what he is saying. He says, I'm urging you brothers to live a lifestyle that is pleasing in the eyesight of God. When, Paul, when I come to church? No, every day. When should I present myself as a sacrifice to God when I'm in front of my preacher? No, every day. When shall I present myself as a living sacrifice unto God? At home, at work, in your car, everywhere, every day. Paul says, I urge you to accept the salvation God has provided. Living sacrifice. That is holy and acceptable to God. Paul's urging should not be foreign to us. For it was Jesus in the gospel according to Matthew that urges us to do the exact same thing. Jesus says in Matthew chapter number 11 verses 28 through 30, learn of me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus urges us to accept the salvation God has provided. Every Sunday, ladies and gentlemen, I extend what is formerly known as an invitation to discipleship. Invitation to discipleship is generally extended for those who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, but they come <coughs> to want to get to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Uh -huh. But note that Paul here in Romans 12 and 1 is not extending an invitation to discipleship. He is not extending an invitation to unbelievers to become believers. He is extending an invitation for believers to become servants. That's right, that's right. Let, let me say that again. Paul is not asking a non-believer to become a believer. He's asking believers to do what believers are supposed to do. I never thought that you would have to ask a believer. 
to do what a believer is supposed to do. I never thought that. I, I never thought that you would have to ask a person who claims to love God to come to church. I never thought that. I never thought that you would have to ask a person who is in love with the Lord Jesus Christ to praise God in the sanctuary. I never thought. I thought that's just what believers did. But Paul urges believers to worship God. Paul understands that I cannot make you worship God. I cannot make you present your bodies a living sacrifice. But the best I can do is urge you to do so. I urge you by the mercies of God. When you really understand all that God has done for us through Jesus Christ, you don't need a praise team, a cheerleader, or anybody else. Praising God is just what you do. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. If you are going to become a servant to God, you must first accept the salvation God has provided. In layman's terms, you must first Receive the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you have not accepted the salvation God has provided in verse number one, then verse number two does not apply to you. <clears throat> Let's try it again. If you say, uh, uh Brother Reverend Pastor preaching to verse number one, you have my permission to excuse yourself right now because verse number two ain't going to help you. If you are going to become a servant of God, not only must you accept the salvation God has provided, but secondly, you must obey the commands God has given. If you ain't got verse 1 down, verse 2 can't help you. If you're going to be a servant to God, not only must you accept the salvation God has provided, accept the Lord Jesus Christ, but secondly, you must obey the commands God has given. Verse number two, Paul essentially gives two commands that result in acceptable service to God. Paul says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Paul says, you must first accept the salvation God has provided. That's not a command. But if you accept it, then here is the command. Okay. Paul says, if you are not a believer, then I can't tell you to do nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you are a believer, all right, all right. now I got something to say to you. <laughs> if you don't know Jesus, yeah, right. baby, do what you do. But if you do know Jesus, you can't act like that. <laughs> people who don't know Jesus do. But if you do know Jesus, come here, let me talk to you for a while. Paul says, if you accept verse number one, 
then verse number two is for you. Notice, Paul essentially gives two commands in verse two. He gives a negative command, that's the A part of verse one, verse two, and the B part of verse two is a positive command. You know something about electronics, don't you? When you put a negative charge with a positive charge, what does it do? It cancels it out. <laughs> Paul says, in order to be what you need to be, you need something to cancel that bad behavior out. Come on now. <laughs> and do not be conformed. to be united with. It literally means to look like. It's a technical term that, that refers to the outer appearance. Paul says, if you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then there ought to be a change on the outside. Okay, stay with me. Yeah, yeah. There ought to be a change on the outside. He said, do not be conformed to this world. Don't look like the world. When I see you, I shouldn't see the world. For you are in the world. But you are not of the world. But Paul says, do not be conformed. Don't look like the Transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
inward change. <clears throat> what should I change, Paul? Paul says you need to change your mind. <laughs> I'm going to have some fun, right? The word mind here comes from the Greek word noose. Come from the Greek word news. It simply refers to the part of the mind that controls your behavior. You do know that your whole mind doesn't control your behavior. Psychologically speaking, it is the cerebral cortex of the frontal lobe of your brain. Give me a hand for that. That controls your behavior. Do you know what the cerebral cortex of the frontal lobe of your brain is? It's right here. You know where it is? It's right here. This is why when you do something stupid, you do this. Why? You hit the cerebral cortex of your frontal lobe because it is the cerebral cortex of your frontal lobe that controls your behavior. Paul says you don't need to change everything about your mind, but you do need to change the part about your mind that controls how you act. Come on now. Paul says, and when you control, when you change your behavior, It'll change the way you look on the outside. You don't have to spend hours in the fashion store saying, does this make me look like I'm going to church? <laughs> does this make me look like I'm a Christian? When you change the cerebral cortex of your frontal lobe, that part of the mind that controls your behavior, you don't have to think about it. It just becomes who you are. Paul says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How, Paul? By changing your behavior. For believer, the change of behavior is encouraged by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. It is the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit that prompts you to do the right thing. Yes. It is your fleshly nature that prompts you to do the wrong thing. Yes. This is why you cannot grieve the Spirit. When the Spirit is prompting you to do what is right, heed the Holy Spirit and do yes. what's right. Yes. But if you have not accepted verse number one, you do not have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. And wrong is what you will do. Paul says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Behave like a Christian ought to behave. Note again, that if you're not a Christian, I ain't talking to you. But if you are a Christian pastor, say it, behave like a Christian ought to behave. If you're not a member of this church, I ain't talking to you. If I ain't your pastor, I ain't talking to you. But if you consider me your pastor and a Christian, pastor say, 
student appreciation celebration. Uh, when I opened the invitation, I noticed that inside the invitation, there was a time that the appreciation would be held. That was the place that the appreciation would be held. There was uh, a bunch of other information that the invitation informed me about. But I noticed that also inside this invitation was a dress code. It said, formal attire is required. All right. 